This video is brought to you by Nomad Lane. In 2023, a New York Times article sounded the alarm that airline close calls were happening far more than people realized. Two planes full of passengers came within 100 feet of each other on a crowded runway in San Diego. A Southwest flight and a private jet almost collided, missing by mere seconds. And just days before, another airliner had to take evasive action mid-flight to avoid a crash. The report stated that in July of 2023 alone, there were 46 near misses involving commercial planes. Each year, media coverage of aviation events has increased, from near misses to serious mechanical failures to overrunning the runway or being overturned on the runway. It feels like we can't go a single day without hearing about an aviation disaster that happened or that was narrowly avoided. It's enough to make even the most seasoned travelers wonder if something's in the air, which begs the question, is flying becoming more dangerous? I'm Gary B. Pilot, and today I'm diving into the truth about the current state of aviation safety. Is flying actually getting riskier, or does it just seem that way? We'll look at the hard data, the accidents, the near misses, and the odds, and the human factors behind the headlines. We'll find out whether aviation in 2025 is actually less safe than it once was, or if it only feels that way. But the truth is more complicated and more surprising than the headlines. So before we start panic canceling flights, let's rewind. We've all heard the term, flying is the safest way to travel. And by the numbers, flying in 2023 had never been safer. The International Air Transport Association reported that 2023 was the safest year on record for commercial aviation. There was only one fatal crash involving a passenger airline that entire year, a Yeti Airlines turboprop in Nepal, which tragically killed 72 people. That's just a single accident worldwide in a year with tens of millions of flights. IATA said at 2023 safety levels, you'd have to fly every single day for over 100,000 years on average to experience a fatal accident. And in 2023, the United States was 14 years into a record-breaking safety streak that would tragically come to an end less than two years later. Looking at the long-term trends, aviation safety has improved drastically. Over the last 30 years, the average number of fatal airline accidents worldwide has roughly been cut in half every 10 years. Technology, training, and regulations have turned flying into one of the safest activities you can do. As Willie Walsh, IATA's Director General put it, with only five fatal accidents out of 32 million flights in 2022, flying is among the safest activities in which a person can engage. 2023 was a record-breaking year for aviation safety. However, 2024 and 2025 took a turn in the wrong direction. Global aviation saw an increase in accidents and fatalities in 2024. According to the International Civil Aviation Organization, there were 95 accidents involving commercial flights in 2024, up from 66 in 2023. That's a 44% jump. Even more jarring, fatalities worldwide spiked from 72 in 2023 to 296 in 2024. That's a 311% increase in lives lost in just one year. Statistically, this is still microscopic. Those 296 fatalities came from just five accidents, and that's out of 35 million worldwide flights annually. The New York Times investigation found US airlines were averaging multiple close calls per week in 2023. Those are incidents where, by luck or skill, disaster was narrowly avoided. None of those close calls resulted in a crash, thankfully, but each one could have been horrific. Personally, as an airline pilot, I think some of these near misses are overblown by the media. For example, the New York Times article states the following. On the afternoon of July 2nd, a Southwest Airlines pilot had to abort a landing at Louis Armstrong New Orleans International Airport. A Delta Airlines 737 was preparing to take off on the same runway. The sudden maneuver avoided a possible collision by seconds. For those of you not in aviation, here's why this incident wasn't even newsworthy. Many. If not most airports routinely have an aircraft take off and land on the same runway. And the rule is simple. A landing aircraft cannot touch down until the departing aircraft is fully airborne. That's it. The system is designed for built-in spacing and multiple layers. Once a landing aircraft crosses the runway threshold, the next airplane holding short is often cleared to line up and wait. Three to five miles out, the next aircraft is inbound to land. This choreography happens all day long at busy airports. The spacing is planned, the timing is expected, and the safeguards are baked in. But occasionally, the timing doesn't line up perfectly. And when that happens, the correct action is to go around. Looking at the Southwest and Delta incident, there were no major mistakes by the pilots or controllers. The spacing was simply off and the pilots correctly did a go around. 
Even further, looking at the animated map, the landing Southwest jet would have never caught up to the departing Delta plane. And even if the Delta plane had just stopped in place, Southwest likely would have turned off the runway with plenty of room to spare. Saying the aircraft avoided a possible collision by seconds is misleading, if not outright false. Would it have broken regulation? Yes. Is it something that came close to being dangerous? No, quite the opposite. But to the average suspecting reader that doesn't know much about aviation, this looks very scary. However, and to give them credit, looking through some other examples, not everything was so mundane. Plenty of these incidents were much more serious. But I'll tell you what's not mundane is the sponsor of this video, Nomad Lane. When you fly for a living, you learn one thing fast. Any bag can look nice, but only a few make travel easier. And the bento bag from Nomad Lane is the best one I've found. Whether I'm flying for work, heading out for a weekend getaway, or traveling across the country with the whole family, the bento bag is built perfectly for every trip. It's packed for smart organization. There's a padded sleeve for my 16-inch laptop, a zip-away water bottle pocket, a dedicated tech pouch, in a key leash, it's reliable because everything has a place. And when my wife travels with the kids, it becomes her go-to bag as well. Same organization, same compartments, same stress-free packing. It slides right over my roller bag, works as a shoulder carry or crossbody, and it fits under the seat on almost any airline. It's lightweight, made with premium materials, weather resistant, and honestly built to survive whatever we put it through. If you want a smart, durable, functional travel companion, check out the bento bag in the link below. And right now they're running a promotion from November 27th through December 2nd. There's 20% off site-wide and 25% off orders over $350, plus a free tabby passport wallet with every order. But thank you to Nomad Lane, and now back to the video. Following a batch of near catastrophes, the FAA held an urgent safety summit and even launched a review committee. They identified 19 serious runway incursions in the first 10 months of 2023, the most in seven years. The FAA started pumping 100 million into reducing these runway risks and deploying new technology to alert controllers of potential collisions. It's like the industry collectively went, yikes, that was close, now it's time to fix this. All this sounds alarming, right? More accidents in 2024, more close calls, more news stories. Naturally, flyers are spooked. One recent poll found 43% of Americans feel less comfortable flying because of recent news coverage, and only two in 10 have high confidence that planes are being well-maintained. Social media is full of posts with people saying they'll never fly again. But before we swear off air travel, let's break down what's really causing these incidents and whether it truly means flying is getting riskier or if it's a temporary rough patch, or if it's just perception. 2025 started off even worse for aviation. On January 29th, a military helicopter collided with an American Airlines regional jet in Washington, DC. While the official investigation isn't complete, it appears the helicopter was at the wrong altitude and FAA bureaucracy ignored serious warnings. Less than a month later, a Delta CRJ had a hard landing in Toronto and flipped over on the runway. It's my humble opinion that snow saved everybody on that flight by putting out the fire. In June of that year, Air India 171 crashed after takeoff, killing 260 people. Six months into 2025, and commercial aviation fatalities had already surpassed all of 2024. So I think it's fair to say that the safety trends and negative social media coverage are going in the wrong direction. So why does it feel like we're seeing all of these things going on at the same time? Well, the answer isn't what you think. The pilot shortage did not appear out of nowhere. And to understand how we got here, you have to rewind more than two decades. After 9-11, airline pilots took one of the biggest financial hits in aviation history. Pay was slashed 20 to 40%, pensions disappeared, work rules that protected rest and schedules and quality of life were gutted. And less than seven years later, the retirement age was changed from 60 to 65. This instantly froze movement for over half a decade. Add in the 2008 financial collapse and the entire industry just stopped. For some more context, when I was hired at the regional airlines in 2007, I made $19,000 a year full time. And back then, that was normal because you were expected to grind it out until you could eventually move up to a major. But suddenly, fewer people wanted to spend $100,000 on flight training when the pay and quality of life weren't there at the airlines anymore. Even the pilots from the Miracle on the Hudson warned Congress about what was coming. During their 2009 testimony, Captain Sully Solenberger said, quote, I do not know a single professional airline pilot who wants his or her children to follow in their footsteps. First Officer Skiles warned Congress that shrinking wages and benefits meant experienced crews in the cockpit will be a thing of the past. Captain Solenberger interrupted to drive the point home. Without experienced pilots, we will see negative consequences to the flying public. And that was a dire prediction that would unfortunately come true. 
So after 2008 and 9-11, the pilots who were still flying were incredibly experienced and stuck. Jobs were so limited that even captains with a decade of command time were being displaced back to first officers. It wasn't unusual to have two captain level pilots flying together on the same flight. In 2009, for example, during the Miracle on the Hudson, Captain Soli had over 19,000 hours of experience. First Officer Jeff Skiles had previously been a captain and had over 15,000 hours of experience. For reference, the minimum legal requirement at the time for a first officer was 250 hours and 1,500 hours to be a captain. The industry was basically held together by the most senior, most experienced pilots aviation had ever seen. I would often sit jump seat during these years, and the combined age of both pilots was usually over 120 on any given mainline flight. But eventually, those senior pilots had to retire, and every retirement created a vacuum behind it, a younger pilot stepping into a seat one by one. For most of aviation history, this happened slowly. And then COVID hit. Thousands of senior pilots took early retirement packages almost overnight. And when travel demand roared back faster than anyone expected, Airlines suddenly had to fill those empty seats immediately. Training pipelines were overloaded. Most pilots moved through the system faster than ever before. And with tens of thousands of pilots retiring each year, the industry wasn't just replacing seats. It was rebuilding the entire experience pyramid from the bottom up. Now this creates an interesting contrast. For a major US airline, the last fatal crash was November of 2001. In that same period, regional carriers had eight fatal accidents. Most of those were linked to pilot error. And regional flying is typically where the youngest and least experienced pilots begin their careers. Now, airlines insist safety has not been compromised, but the pressure is real. Training, qualification standards, recurrent checks, upgrades, and simulator time are all under strain because the demand for pilots is enormous and the supply is not keeping up. When experience leaves faster than it can be replaced, the entire system feels the strain. And pilots aren't the only piece of that system. There's another group just as critical to safety, and they're under even more pressure right now air traffic control. If pilots are the rock stars of the sky, air traffic controllers are the unsung heroes on the ground, and we don't have enough of them. The FAA is about 3,000 controllers short of what's needed. A government audit in 2023 found that 77% of critical air traffic control facilities are staffed below safe levels. Controllers are pulling crazy overtime, six day weeks, 10 hour shifts, which unsurprisingly can lead to fatigue. Many of those runway close calls have been linked to human error by controllers. As one aviation lawyer put it, system has been blinking red, screaming that it's overloaded. The FAA knows this is a huge problem. They hired 1,500 new controllers last year and have 2,600 in training. But training takes years. And in the meantime, the agency convened a special panel to study controller fatigue and even started rolling out new tech to help prevent collisions when humans slip up. Still, until staffing recovers, the risk remains. Another piece of the puzzle we have to look at, air travel is at record numbers again, which is great for the industry, but it means the skies and airports are crowded. 2023 saw a 17% jump in flights globally as travel rebounded, and 2024 continued that trend. More planes equals more chances for things to go wrong if the system isn't prepared. Experts have warned that certain busy airspaces like New York and DC are especially risky. Modern planes have great collision avoidance tech and strict procedures, but as the saying goes, the margin for error is thin. Believe it or not, some of our aviation infrastructure is old, like really old. The air traffic control system core technology is aging and the upgrades have been slow. Captain Sully Solenberger pointed out that certain airports have control towers and layouts dating back to the 1930s. While we have added modern radar and warning systems, some airports still lack the latest ground radar or other tools that could add an extra layer of safety. These improvements take time and money to implement. And until then, it's modern planes and ancient equipment, not exactly the dream team. Finally, we have to talk about the internet's role in all of this. If you were to compare aviation news stories to aviation accidents on a graph, you would see a clear disconnect. These days, every little aviation incident seems to go viral. A plane skids off the taxiway, an emergency landing with no injuries, it's trending with dramatic commentary. Social media has a way of amplifying these stories big time. And it's not just news outlets, it's regular people sharing and resharing, which makes these events feel way more personal and way more frequent. As one expert explained, we don't see the tens of thousands of flights that don't have any problems. We only see the rare and scary ones over and over again. Many are now terrified of flying due to a handful of viral incidents, even though statistically, the numbers have barely moved. Aviation has a long tradition of investigating these events and fixing the problems before they lead to a disaster. It's often said that every safety regulation is written in blood, meaning historically, we improved safety after a horrific crash taught us a painful lesson. 
In other words, we shouldn't wait for a tragedy to address a problem. A close call is a chance to fix something proactively. And it's that philosophy is what kept aviation so safe for so long. It's a relentless, almost obsessive focus on safety, learning from every mistake, no matter how small. It's how pilots and controllers are trained. After any incident or error, you debrief, you analyze, and you improve. Nobody in the aviation wants to go back to the old days of reactive safety. The goal is zero fatalities, period. As the president of ICAO's council said about the 2024 stats, these figures are a timely reminder that sustained collective action is necessary to keep improving towards zero deaths. The verdict, still super safe, but no time for complacency. Here's the truth. Flying is still incredibly safe. The perceived danger has gone up, but the actual risk to any one passenger is almost nil. Your odds of dying in a commercial airline crash are about one in 11 million. For comparison, your lifetime odds of being killed by a meteorite are one in 1.6 million. Meanwhile, cars kill people every day, and we don't panic when we see fender benders on the news. However, the recent uptick in reported incidents is still a warning sign. Not because flying suddenly became dangerous, but because the system is under stress. We're dealing with a post-pandemic travel surge, less experienced pilots, understaffed air traffic control, and a social media landscape that turns every minor hiccup into a headline. So when someone asks me, is flying more dangerous? My answer is no. Flying isn't more dangerous. In many ways, it's even safer. But statistics without context can be misleading. That one in 11 million number is a global average. A major US or European airline with a modern fleet is not the same risk profile as a turboprop in the Himalayas. Even charts that look impressive can hide variables. For example, this chart I found on Reddit. When you factor in the massive increase in flights per year, most safety graphs would slope even more dramatically downward. And that blue incidence line, it's including everything. Bird strikes, rejected takeoffs, minor write-ups, hard landings, most of which pose zero threat to passengers. So here's the good news. Every scare gets investigated and the industry takes these signals seriously. Regulators, pilots, mechanics, and controllers are all constantly tightening procedures, upgrading systems, and fixing weaknesses. It's my opinion, however, that the FAA needs to step up even more, but the industry as a whole sees the issue clearly. Flying is still absurdly almost comically safe. The odds are overwhelmingly in your favor. And behind the scenes, thousands of professionals are working nonstop to make it even safer. So if this video made you feel more confident about your next flight, hit that like button, drop a comment, and let me know your thoughts. Until next time, stay safe.